They were one of the most notorious street gangs in Canada, and their founder and leader became one of Canada's most wanted men. Wolf was serving life in prison for two counts of first-degree murder. Nationally, we have the reputation of being the murder crime capital of Canada and violent crime capital. A lot of people um, refer to Winnipeg as murder peg. Hey guys, in today's video, we'll be turning our attention to the Aboriginal gang scene in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where native gangs have been active for decades. More specifically, we'll be talking about the Wolf Brothers, Daniel and Richard, aka the founders of Canada's largest street gang in history, named the Indian Posse. Let's get into it. Aboriginal gang violence in Manitoba is often seen as a byproduct of the challenging circumstances faced by the indigenous populations in those parts of Canada. These circumstances include poverty, drug addiction, crime, and also trauma from the likes of residential schools. The Wolf Brothers, Daniel and Richard, suffered those living conditions as children. Richard Wolf was born in 1975 and Danny Wolf just a year later. Both their parents were drug addicts and their mother, Susan, had admitted to lacking adequate parenting skills and also revealed that they lived in an abusive and violent home. Their father left the family and Susan's drug habits meant that she was spending her welfare checks on alcohol. Meanwhile, her two young sons went hungry for days at a time. Court documents revealed that their brothers had very little to eat and soon learned to steal vegetables and ate from dumpsters to survive. The older brother, Richard, started using drugs at the age of 10 and had begun consuming alcohol by 11 years old. He had been arrested 20 times before he turned 12. The brothers would stay out late, completely unsupervised, and get involved in petty crimes, once stealing a van to drive from Winnipeg to Regina. They'd been gone for a week when the police caught up to them. All of this was happening while their mother was out of the picture. She was consumed by alcohol and had blurred memories of what was happening in her children's lives. Like many other Aboriginal kids around them, Daniel and Richard were taken to foster homes, but they always ran away. Instead of coming home, they preferred staying on the streets. According to their mother, Richard and Daniel saw themselves as survivors and were prepared to do whatever it took to make it out of the horrible lives they were living. The brothers founded the Indian Posse Gang in 1988 in the basement of their mother's Winnipeg home. The gang had seven founding members, all of them native and from similarly poor families. Richard Wolf was only 13 at the time and in an interview many years later, he disclosed the motivation behind the formation of the Indian Posse. The gang was about Aboriginals sticking together because they lived similar lives and were looked down upon in society. Richard said, We were living under the same roofs and everyone had the same struggles. No food in the fridge, empty beer bottles in the house. They reportedly used the term Indian as a part of their name to turn an insult people would use against them into something of pride. Their brothers hoped that the gang would turn into a movement, providing native youngsters with everything they lacked growing up, money, respect, and most importantly, a family. The Indian Posse used slogans such as Red Till Dead and Fuck Canada, This Land Is Our People. Their symbol was a red bandana, signifying the group's dedication to the Aboriginal population. However, the gang would end up terrorizing the same families they had planned to defend. The Indian Posse was involved in low-level organized street crime, promoted drugs and prostitution, and was involved in assaults and break and enters. The gang was also very active in correctional institutions, using fear, violence, and intimidation to recruit non-members to keep control of their turf. Richard Wolf was only 13 when he bought his first handgun, and soon after, he was keeping an AK-47 and getting involved in extortion. Winnipeg police say that the gang started off with petty theft and break-ins making some money out of it. However, in 1991, still only 15 and 14 years of age, Richard and Daniel started selling drugs. They bought a house and moved away from their mother who was still suffering from her addiction. By 1994, the Indian Posse had formed links with gangs in North and South Dakota and regularly visited Vancouver's Indo-Canadian gangs to set up a cross-border drug trade. At the time, the Wolf Brothers were making $15,000 to $30,000 a week. In addition to collecting drug profits from the people under them, Richard Wolf was also running a prostitution business. The gangs were reportedly using children to run a lot of their operations, even tragically forcing girls as young as 10 years old for prostitution. Despite their claims of defending the Aboriginal families, the drugs they sold and the prostitution business they operated was all affecting the Aboriginal youth. The Indian Posse imitated the Hells Angels methods of intimidating rivals, doing things like kidnapping rivals and making them dig their own grave. Meanwhile, loads of drugs were being pumped into the streets, also causing an increase in drive-by shootings. Daniel Wolf, however, thought that they weren't brutal enough and preferred walk-by shootings instead. Again, the majority of the victims came from the very community the Indian Posse had originally pledged to defend. As the drug and violence increased, so did the Indian Posse's need to maintain their reputation. Richard Wolf was making millions, but his fast rise came to a grinding halt in 1995. A Winnipeg pizza joint owed $60,000 to Richard Wolf. 
The debt wasn't paid for a long time and Richard believed that his reputation in the streets was at stake. He decided to set an example that he shouldn't be crossed and placed an order for a pizza at the same joint. When his delivery arrived, he opened fire, but luckily the driver survived. However, warrants were out for Richard's arrest and soon he was behind bars. Before the trial, Danny Wolf tried to intimidate the witnesses to help his brother out, but he too was arrested by the police and charged with obstruction of justice. Richard's previous run-ins with the justice system and his open act of violence earned him a 17-year prison sentence. Danny Wolf himself was a serial offender and had been in and out of prison ever since the brothers established the Indian Posse in 1988. He was also sentenced yet again for two years. The Indian Posse's aggressive recruitments continued in prison and there they developed a fierce rivalry with the Manitoba Warriors. The Warriors were also an exclusively Aboriginal gang and adopted the style of the Hells Angels to grow their crime syndicate. Jail confrontations became a common occurrence for the two gangs. During one feud, an 18 hour long riot occurred at the Headingley Correctional Centre in Manitoba in 1996. The riot resulted in serious injuries to 8 prison guards, 4 of which had their fingers chopped off. Violence of such magnitude brought the Indian Posse to national attention. The gang quickly expanded within the correctional facilities and the Aboriginal circles. At one point, the gang had at least 3,000 members, with some reports even putting the number of the Indian Posse members at 12,000, making it the largest street gang in Canada's history. Danny Wolf was out in 1998, but his criminal lifestyle continued, and in 1999, he was convicted of armed robbery. Danny went to prison yet again, this time to serve an 8 year sentence. However, his illegal activities continued. He was incarcerated with a man named Gary Mattox, the leader of the Montreal's West End gang. Danny befriended Gary, whose gang controlled the port of Montreal, where they were bringing in huge amounts of illegal drugs. The Indian Posse's alliance with the West End gang elevated them from a street gang to a major player in Manitoba's drug trade. The alliance also helped the Indian Posse to directly rival the Hells Angels, who were doing most of their business with the Manitoba Warriors at the time. Danny was also involved in the killing of a fellow Indian Posse leader, Sheldon McKay, while in prison, who was killed by other Indian Posse members as an in-house coup to remove him from power. This was because Sheldon had been giving out orders to kill their fellow Indian Posse members as a part of something he called an internal cleansing. Danny and other Indian Posse members weren't happy with this, so they took him out. Danny Wolf completed his prison sentence in 2007, but he wasn't out for long. In September of the same year, Danny encountered a rival native syndicate gang member named Bernard Percy Pascal at a bar. Pascal insulted Danny's Indian Posse tattoos. After Pascal left the bar, Wolf remarked, they don't know what's coming for them. Danny showed up at Percy's house later that night and opened fire. There were several people at the house who were caught in the shooting. Two people died while Pascal and two others sustained injuries. Before opening fire, Danny uttered the words, that'll teach you to mess with the Indian Posse. Security camera footage from the bar showed Danny Wolf arguing with Percy Pascal and he was arrested. Police records revealed that the case against Danny wasn't rock solid, but the police put an undercover cop with him to get a confession. Danny admitted to the cop that he was done and they were surely going to give him a life sentence. While awaiting trial and not liking his chances of being able to avoid jail, Danny came up with a daring plan. He was going to break out of prison. He started digging in a spot where the prison security cameras were blinded and kept digging for 4 months. Finally, in August 2008, he along with his accomplices decided that it was time to go. The hole in the ground was big enough and Danny along with some other inmates ran away into the darkness of the night. Once outside, he decided to stay in Winnipeg, a place where he was known, feared and respected. He managed to stay away from the police radar for three weeks, until someone betrayed him and tipped the police of his whereabouts. He was arrested again at a gas station. In November 2009, Danny Wolf was convicted of two counts of first degree murder and three counts of attempted murder and given a 25 year sentence. In sentencing Danny, the judge remarked that his case showed that Danny had no regard for human life, also saying that it was one of the worst of its type in the history of this province. Once again, Danny wouldn't stay in jail for long. However, this time he didn't escape. Just two months into his sentence, Danny was killed after a brawl involving 10 inmates inside Saskatchewan Penitentiary. He was stabbed in the chest and died just moments later. Danny wasn't the target of the attack, but had got involved to protect a fellow prisoner and an Indian Posse member. Danny Wolf was no more, but Richard was just completing a sentence for attempted murder. He was released in 2010 and had vowed to turn his life around. He joined counseling groups and tried to teach youth about the hazards of being involved in gang life. Out of prison, Richard had to battle with many tragedies. After Danny's death, Richard also had to deal with the loss of his father in 2011 and his stepson in 2013. Soon, he was back to taking drugs and drinking. While he was struggling to get his life back on track, Richard was helped by a couple who had let him stay at their home. 
However, after a night of drinking, Richard Wolf ended up sexually assaulting the woman who was helping him. He tried to have sex with her while she was sleeping. Hearing the woman scream, her boyfriend attempted to come to her rescue, and was attacked by Richard who hit him with a baseball bat, giving him head injuries and movement issues. Two days later, he turned himself in and told his lawyer that he had no recollection of the incident, but was going to prison for a long time. He pleaded guilty to one count of rape and one count of assault with a deadly weapon in the March of 2015. Richard faced 5 years in jail where he was kept in solitary confinement for 23 hours of the day. The prison decided that it was too risky for him to be mixing up with other prisoners. The solitary confinement took its toll on Richard's mental health and he suffered from severe depression. On May 27, 2016, Richard Wolf had a heart attack in the prison's exercise yard and was rushed to the hospital. However, he didn't survive. And that was the end of the violent, disturbing, and tragic story of the life of two brothers who were thrown into the gang life by their circumstances and ended up making life miserable for the same people they wanted to liberate. They remain controversial figures among Aboriginal groups, with some hailing them as heroes with flaws due to a rough past, while others believe that they have further victimized an already suffering Indigenous population of Canada. The story isn't just a tale of criminals meeting their fate, but also a reflection of how systematic inequalities can lead to crime. This story illustrates the changes needed in many communities where poverty, drug addiction, and crime exist, and also the Canadian prison system, which instead of acting as correction centers, was actually creating a new breed of gangsters. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and want to see more in the future. It helps out the channel so much. Also, let me know what you want to see next down in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a good one.